Rediscover God's Word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. This is Real Bible Study with teacher Tom Bradford. Welcome to Torah Class. We're nearing the end of Revelation chapter 5, all of which takes place in heaven. Now, I emphasize this because beginning in chapter 6, the scene will shift to planet Earth. Now, one of the fundamental principles we need to keep up front in our minds regards that of the sealed scroll itself. That is, the meaning of the scroll that is sealed with seven seals is that what is written in it was long ago decided. By long ago, I'm speaking temporally. I'm speaking in terms of the way that we measure time in our universe. By that standard, what is going to be revealed in the sealed scroll was decided upon thousands, if not millions of years ago, and then set on the cosmic shelf until the time is right. Of course, by heaven's standard, there's no such thing as time. Past, present, future, they have no meaning. So it's not as though the spiritual creatures of heaven, including God himself, have been waiting in the sense that we would think of it. Therefore, we must wrap our minds around the reality that everything that has happened in human history from Adam through today, beyond to the end, was known by God, if not fully planned and orchestrated by God. Another principle to remember is that while John is just learning of the contents of the sealed scroll by means of visions, the carrying out of what was written has yet to happen on earth. Although no doubt John expected it to occur shortly after his vision experience. Thus, humanity has known since roughly 90 AD the skeletal blueprints of what is to come. So the human race has no excuse. When all the horror that was written begins to take place, we cannot say, but we didn't know. When we read and study Revelation, we must always admit to ourselves that what we take from it will be imperfect, it will be incomplete, because the bulk of it is unfulfilled prophecy. It is ever tempting for us as disciples, as students, as teachers, or especially of Bible commentators, to kind of fill in the blanks to make speculations that often become inalterable doctrines. Now, I, I realize it can be frustrating as humans, and especially as Christian humans, to not be able to find ready, solid answers to questions about our faith and our holy book that we feel are important to us. But it's going to continue to be my position and approach to teaching this apocalypse that when something cannot be reasonably and firmly answered and backed up by Holy Scripture, we'll discuss the various possibilities, but we will not declare them as fact. In chapter 5, as the Lamb that was slain but is now alive, Yeshua, took the scroll from his Father's right hand and he began to open the seals, on the scroll, we found that three songs or hymns were sung to him, with the first one beginning in verse 9. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. Because you were slaughtered, at the cost of blood you ransomed for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them into a kingdom for God to rule. Kohanim, priests, 
to serve him, and they will rule over the earth. This was called a new song because what was occurring had never happened before. The 24 elders singing this song had not done so in the past. This song reminds us of Exodus 19, 5 and 6, where we read, now if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine and you will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. And now indeed, believers have paid attention to what God told us, and we have become a kingdom of priests for him as he has always intended. Let's move on now to Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 and continue our study. Open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it'll be page 1538. 1538. And we'll read till the end. Revelation 5, starting at verse 11 to the end. Then I looked, and I heard the sound of a vast number of angels, thousands and thousands, millions and millions. They were all around the throne, the living beings and the elders, and they shouted out, Worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, yes, everything in them saying, to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb, belong praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. The four living beings said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Verses 11 and 12 form the second hymn. But this time, instead of only the 24 elders, at God's throne singing to the Lord. They're joined by millions upon millions of angels who agree with God that the Lamb is worthy of receiving power, riches, glory, honor, and praise. Now, please note, it's important. God's very existence as God makes Him worthy of possessing all of these things because he is the creator of everything. But the Lamb only receives these things from the one who by nature possesses them and so has the right to give them to whomever he chooses. Well, next in verse 13, the third hymn is sung in, in addition to the 24 elders and the millions of angels. Every living creature that God has ever created, those unspecified spirit beings in heaven, those unspecified physical beings on the surface of the earth and under it, meaning the dead. All those in the sea, all add their voices to the chorus. So what we see is that with each successive song or hymn, a larger and larger number of creatures join in praising the Lamb so that everything that lives in heaven and on earth acknowledges the Lordship of Christ. And finally, to end the series of praise songs to the Lord Yeshua, the four living beings shout, Amen! And the 24 elders fall on their faces to worship Him. So all creatures, living and dead, spiritual and physical, great and small, agree and acknowledge the magnitude of what has just happened. And they also acknowledge their allegiance 
to the Son of God. I mean, I, I can't even imagine the emotions of awe that John must have been experiencing as the scene unfolded in his vision. Well, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Page 1538 in the Complete Jewish Bible. Next I watched as the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living beings say in a thundering voice, Go! And I looked, and there in front of me was a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode off as a conqueror to conquer. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Go! And another horse went out, a red one. Its rider was given the power to take peace away from the earth and make people slaughter each other. He was given a great sword. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Go! And I looked, and there in front of me was a black horse. Its rider held in his hand a pair of scales. And then I heard what sounded like a voice from among the four living beings say, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages. Six pounds of barley for the same price, but don't damage the oil or the wine. And when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living being say, Go! And I looked, and there in front of me was a pallid, sickly-looking horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Sheol followed behind him. They were given authority to kill one quarter of the world by war, famine, and by plagues, and with the wild animals of the earth. And when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been put to death for proclaiming the word of God, that is, for bearing witness. They cried out in a loud voice, Sovereign ruler, HaKadosh, the Holy, the True One, how long will it be before you judge the people living on earth and avenge our blood? Each of them was given a white robe. They were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants should be reached, of their brothers who would be killed just as they had been. And then I watched as he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black as sackcloth, worn in mourning. The full moon became blood red. Stars fell from heaven to earth just as a fig tree drops its uh, figs when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll being rolled up. Every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the earth's kings, the rulers, the generals, the rich and the mighty, indeed everyone, slave and free, hid himself in caves among the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne and from the fury of the Lamb. For the great day of their fury has come. Who can stand? From here on, what we will read takes place in the physical realm on earth. And what we are reading about is often called the day of the Lord or, or judgment day. That is, it is when God begins in earnest to carry out his judgment on the earth and upon its inhabitants, and his judgment is that the world deserves his wrath. That's his judgment. So in verse 1, the lamb that was slain but is now alive breaks open the first of the seven seals. Now I want to pause here to say that especially at this point is when so much varying and opposing Christian doctrines on the end times plays a significant role in how one interprets the staggering, the often confusing events being depicted in the book of Revelation. Even the naming convention that the various doctrines employ to explain and define their beliefs play a role. For instance, 
especially pre-tribulation dispensationalists, perhaps representing the largest segment of mainstream Protestant Christianity. Interpret the timing of these events in terms of three earth-shattering phenomena called the rapture, the tribulation, and the great tribulation. Setting aside discussion of the rapture for now, their end times doctrine revolves around the existence of two named time periods that can be identified and put on a timeline. One is called the tribulation. The other is called the great tribulation. Now, the tribulation is the name of a specific period of trauma on earth that extends for precisely seven years. The great tribulation is the name of another period of trauma, even greater than the first, that essentially marks the second half of the seven years of the tribulation. However, the only way one can establish the actual existence of these two named events is by adding a key word to the scriptures that isn't there in the oldest texts of the New Testament that we have, those that are written in Greek. The word is ton, ton in Greek, which translates to the, T-H-E, the in English. In other words, while Revelation indeed speaks of times, speaks of times of tribulation, and of a great tribulation, it never speaks of the tri tribulation or the great tribulation, except in one instance, and we'll discuss that thoroughly when we get there. This is not just semantics. By turning the biblical term philipsis, tri tribulation, into a proper noun, by putting the word the before it, and then attaching it to the so-called 70th week of Daniel, a quite detailed map of the end times is created. Even though Revelation tells us that when the end times arrive, there will be troubles for mankind that increase into greater troubles. Tribulation increases and becomes greater tribulation. Revelation does not speak of them as identifiable named events. Now, those who adhere to the pre-tribulation doctrine also claim that before the opening of the first seal by Christ, the church has already been raptured. Thus, according to this doctrine, believers are already gone from earth, living in heaven now, before the beginning of the events of Revelation chapter 6. Now, while I'll speak more on this in later lessons, I think it's only proper that I should tell you where I come down on this, while acknowledging that in no way do I claim my thoughts on this matter are infallible. I believe that by the end of chapter 6, all believers will have experienced the rapture. And what, that whatever believers remain on earth can only be those who have accepted Christ since the moment that the rapture occurred. And probably many will be believers because they witnessed the rapture. That said, I don't agree with the typical pre-tribulation timeline that does two things. First of all, it calls the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments the time of tribulation. That is, the 21 judgments that God hurls upon the earth and his inhabitants, beginning with the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6 that we're reading. And second, that God therefore lifts all believers to a safe place by means of an event called the rapture to avoid a period of particularly difficult tribulation. I want to be clear, I do not see these 21 judgments as a period of time called the tribulation. 
Rather, I call these 21 judgments, that begin chapter 6, mostly as the time of God's wrath. And so see them as quite separate and fundamentally different from a period of tribulation that is represented by the first four seals. God's wrath seems to consist of 17 of the 21 named supernaturally caused events heaped upon mankind and the earth, starting in chapter 6 with the breaking of the seven seals. Now, tribulation, perhaps including great tribulation, is not necessarily supernaturally sent by God in the sense that we typically think of it. Rather, it is brought about by mankind's own evil inclination running wild, but no doubt satanically provoked. An example of this would be Hitler's genocide against the Jews. As horrible as this was, it was not a supernatural act of God. It was not God's wrath. <laughs> but boy, it was tribulation. It was nearly a nearly unparalleled act of evil inspired by one of the most wicked human beings the world has ever known. Thus, while I see believers being removed from harm's way prior to God raining down supernatural catastrophe from heaven, I do not see believers being delivered from oppression and tribulation that has always bedeviled mankind. That is, the suffering that is caused by the evil of human against human. The biblical pattern has always been that God's worshipers will suffer through, through persecution and, and, and tribulation as perhaps the greatest opportunities to witness to His glory and salvation. But what God does not do is pour out His supernatural wrath indiscriminately upon the guilty and those who He has declared innocent. In Noah's day, God made provision for the final eight faithful God worshipers on earth before He purified the world through a destructive flood by having them build an ark and board it before those rains came. In Abraham's day, God removed every remaining God worshiper from Sodom before he devastated the city with supernatural fire. In Moses' day, the Lord protected the Israelites in Egypt from the ravages of the ten supernatural plagues he sent to Egypt to force Pharaoh to let his people go. However, in every case, God's people suffered under the evil of other humans. So I see the end times rapture in that same light. As believers, we will not suffer God's wrath as defined as the 21, or I think perhaps 17, judgments we're about to study. But we will suffer through many terrible, humanly inspired evils, such as war and genocide, and perhaps including the ruination of our precious environment that has provided a safe home for us for millennia. I label these humanly inspired events as tribulation, and at some point even great tribulation, something that we are warned is coming. Why would believers be warned tribulation is coming and that we must overcome and stay faithful unto death if we're not going to be around to suffer it? Doesn't even make sense. Pre-tribulation doctrine adherents say this is speaking only of those who become believers after the rapture. 
happens. Eh, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, I can't completely discount that as a possibility, but that would certainly be out of character for Scripture and prophecy in general. Well, back to verse 1. Now, first let me say that a reasonably good case could be made that the four horses of, these, of the differing colors being sent out do not represent God's wrath, but rather is satanic wrath, causing human evil to greatly increase. In fact, I lean in that direction. It is undeniable that such is a possible understanding to keep in mind. Upon the first seal being broken, one of the four living beings surrounding God's throne announces with a loud voice, Go. This command to go brought forth a white horse and a rider. And this rider carried a bow, he wore a crown, and together the horse and the rider went out conquering. Following this, three more horses with riders will be set out, each one ordered in turn by one of the four living beings. These four horses and riders are known in literary and artistic circles as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, quite interestingly, the Bible scholar world is fairly equally divided on whether or not the rider on the white horse is to be identified as Christ or as the Antichrist. This was not always the case. In my research into what the early church fathers thought about this, to a man, they believed that the white horse was the gospel and the rider was Jesus. As for the other three horses and riders, most of the early church fathers saw them as sowers of evil and hardship, a harbinger of the coming of God's harsh hand of punishment and judgment, and good cases can be made for both sides of the debate. However, for me, the weight of evidence leans more strongly in one direction. Since John's visions are invariably about fulfilling the, the many Old Testament prophecies about the end times and the day of the Lord, then it was, it's within the context of those prophecies that we need to look for understanding. If the tone and the context of those prophecies is entirely different than what we find in John's vision, then we have God using allegory to get his message across to John, and that's something I just cannot accept. So in search of the most direct reference among the prophets to the going out of four horses to wreak havoc on humanity, Bible scholars generally agree it must be Zechariah chapter 6. Here's Je Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Again I raised my eyes, and I saw in front of me four chariots coming out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, the fourth chariot spotted gray horses. And I asked the angel speaking with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered me, These are the four winds of the sky that go out after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the land. Then the one with the black horses going out towards the land of the north. The white horses have gone out after them, and the spotted have gone out towards the land in the south. Then the gray ones went out and were seeking to go and wander throughout the whole earth when he said, wander throughout the whole earth, and they did wander throughout the whole earth. Then he called out to me and said, look, the ones going to the land in the north have given my spirit rest in the north country. So in Zechariah, God bids four horses or teams of horses 
of almost identically described colors as those John describes in Revelation to go out and patrol the earth and to punish those nations who have oppressed his people, Israel. These horses are pulling chariots, which means they're for one thing only, war. For one, one thing that I think helps to even better connect this Zechariah passage with Revelation 6 is that in Zechariah chapter 6, Zechariah asks about who the horses and chariots are, and he receives an answer. However, I think the complete Jewish Bible translation unnecessarily muddies the waters by coming up with a decidedly different interpretation than practically all other reliable Bible translations. The complete Jewish Bible says the angel answers Zechariah that the four horses are the four winds of the sky. However, almost all other Bible versions say the angel answers the four horses are the four spirits of heaven. Why does it come out this way? See, in Hebrew, now this is Greek, but remember we're, we're dealing with Hebrew thought here. Okay, John was a Hebrew. The Hebrew word that, can be trans, that is translated as wind in the complete Jewish Bible is ruach. And ruach indeed can mean wind, but more commonly it means spirit. The Hebrew word that is being translated in sky in the complete Jewish Bible, shamaim. And shamaim can mean sky, more commonly it means heaven. The context helps us to determine which way to take the meaning of these two words. So considering that these four horses are sent out, we're told in Zechariah, after standing before the Lord, we're told. They stood before the Lord in heaven. Then, and of course, they are symbolic and spiritual in nature. They're not actual horses and actual chariots. I agree with the bulk of translations that say that these horses represent something called the four spirits of heaven. And that fits very nicely with the four horses in Revelation chapter 6. So in both Revelation chapter 6 and Zechariah chapter 6, the four horses are dealt with as a group. A group that has a common purpose. And that purpose is create havoc. Create chaos and death on earth. It is true that in the Bible, white usually signifies purity. Further, the writer is said to be wearing a crown. Now together, these two characteristics sound pretty Christ-like, don't they? However, the black, red, and grayish green or spotted horses are sent out to do evil things that cause terrible woes. So it's difficult to find a good cause to separate the white horse from out of the group and have its symbolism interpreted as indicating good when the symbolism of the other three is to be seen that as that of evil. Now the issue of the crown is also a challenging one as Christ is said to be king in Revelation and, and elsewhere in the New Testament. Yet the word used in this verse for the crown upon the rider of the white horse is Stephanos. Stephanos. And it is used in reference to a laurel wreath that's given to victors in athletic competition. But a crown for a king in Greek is typically diadema, diadem, diadema. So we also have the rider of the white horse using a bow. What's a bow for? It's a weapon of war. In Israel, this time, horses were not used for transportation. They were used for chariots or they were ridden by soldiers. 
So symbolically, these horses are war horses. Then we have the matter of how the scene in heaven unfolds. If we take the rider of the white horse to be Christ, then we have Christ opening the first seal of the scroll with the result that one of the four living beings orders him to mount a white horse, take a bow in his hand, and that Christ is to go create war and chaos on earth. So with all these considerations, it seems more likely than not, that the, to me at least, that the white horse and its rider are satanic in nature. That is, that this is symbolic of the Antichrist. And the reason that we find so many characteristics that one could easily see as Christ-like is because the Christ, the Antichrist Christ tries to achieve his victory through deception. People are going to hold him up as the Messiah. To help us sort this out, Charles Lee Feinberg makes the salient point that we should not be so much concerned with the individuals on the horses, but rather with the purpose of the horse and rider together and the four horses and riders as a group. Thus, we should probably not make the unwarranted assumption that the white horse is being sent out for an entirely opposite purpose of the other three horses. Because otherwise, we have the first one more or less count, trying to counteract the purpose of the other three. So whether or not the white horse and its rider, rider is meant to symbolize the Antichrist specifically, or as an inciter of war and violence in general, I do think the purpose is evil. Now if you're paying close attention to what I've been saying, then an obvious question must be, would our God actually order evil to be sent upon the world, especially since the four horsemen of the apocalypse are said to be going out from heaven? This presents a theological challenge of some proportions, because it's common in Christianity to declare that the Lord only deals in good. And it's against his nature to deal in evil. However, the scriptures tell us something a little different. In Isaiah 45, 7, God is speaking. I form light. I create darkness. I make well-being. I create woe. I, Adonai, do all of these things. The the uh, King James Version puts this slightly differently. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now the word that the complete Jewish Bible translates as woe, but the, the uh, King James Version translates as evil is ra. R-A-H, ra. Both translations are correct. And really, they mean about the same thing. Woe is usually the result of evil in the Bible. And when we understand this, and we understand that with the 21 judgments of Revelation, God is sending 21 woes to the world, to say He is sending evil is merely semantics. So yes, God does send evil things to the world in order to bring about His will, and to execute judgment upon humans, and at times to test the faith of his worshipers. Therefore, it makes sense that the white horse and its rider are being sent to cause the specter of evil to erupt globally. So then in verse 3, the second seal is broken. A second horse, a red one now is sent out with its rider holding a great sword. Red is usually the biblical symbol for blood. And so, and as with so many biblical symbols, blood can be used for good and it can be used for evil. 
Thus, blood can be a symbol of life and atonement for redemption. It can be a symbol of murder and destruction. This duo's mission was to remove peace from the world and to promote men killing men on a massive scale. Now, while this can be taken primarily to speak of wars, of, of nation against nation, it can also speak of all modes of humans intentionally, unjustly, and maliciously flaunting God's laws by killing humans by means of government oppression, criminal activity, terrorism, and yes, even abortion. And verse 5, the third seal is broken. And the third of the four living beings calls forth a black horse, bearing a rider carrying a balance scale. Now notice how there are four living beings and four horses, with each living being calling forth a specific horse and rider as though there is some association or connection between them. We aren't given enough information to know for certain what that connection might be. However, remember that Zechariah 6 said that the four horses were the four spirits of heaven and the four unique and powerful living beings are also four spirits in heaven. So this may well be the connection, but that's just my speculation. So the scale that is being held by the rider of that third horse the scale symbolizes commerce because its purpose of the scale is to measure money and commodities. In this case, it is to weigh out scarce food. Thus, famine is being sent upon the world by God, no doubt caused in large part by war and strife instigated by the first two horses and their riders so that fields can't be planted, they can't, the crops can't be harvested. Now, as the scarcity sets in, the expense of food rises to more than an average person can pay. In the ancient world, a denarius was the wage a man would earn for a day's labor, a quart of wheat costing a denarius or three quarts of barley for the same is about 10 times the normal cost. Here it is meant as a metaphor, indicating that everything that a man could earn in a day would be needed to buy good quality food sufficient for only one day for one person. Or in regards to the barley, a less desirable food sufficient for three persons for one day. And yet the oil and the wine were not to be harmed. This means the well-off could continue to enjoy the finer things of life, oil and wine, even as the poor struggle for basic survival. Now, think about it for a second. What would be the result one might expect from this situation? How about civil strife and class warfare, but on a global scale, as the poor rebel in fury and desperation against the rich and the ruling elite, who always seem to be insulated from the troubles that affect everybody else. Well, in verse 7, the Lamb breaks the fourth seal. And in response, the fourth horseman set out by the fourth living being. The fourth horse is variously described as pale, ashen, pallid. It's often equated with dappled, greenish, grayish, even off-white. The Greek word being translated actually is chloros. Chloros. And literally it means the light green color of plants. 
but it is also used to describe the color of a person who's very ill. The point being, the horse looks sickly because it represents pestilence and disease. Now, interestingly, the final horse and rider are given a name, Death and Hades. Now, we need to grasp that Hades was the imagined underworld of the Greeks, along with all of its mythology. The idea that's trying to be conveyed, of course, is a Hebrew idea. So the better translation would be death and Sheol, since Sheol is the place of the dead that we read about in the Bible that John would have been familiar with. So the four horsemen bring death through one means or another to the inhabitants of planet Earth. Now, I want to state at this point that my best understanding of Revelation is that this will occur shortly before the rapture of believers. If I'm correct, then recipients of the woes and the evil that the four horsemen of the apocalypse bring is upon non-believers and believers. Now, it's always important that death is seen by believers as outside of the perfect will of God, and generally speaking, as satanic in origin. This is not to say that Jehovah doesn't use death for his purposes, just as he can turn many things intended for evil into a greater good. But our God is not a God of death. He's a God of life. I cannot bypass this without mentioning that any religion that glorifies death above life and killing is good and even joyful thing is worthy only of scorn, because it is not of God. Rather, such a religion has the devil as, as its father. It is no coincidence that in the 6th century, as Christianity was overtaking the world by preaching Messiah's message of love and peace and restoration, that Satan would rise in opposition by creating its opposite, Islam, which preaches hate, war, death, and subjugation. And today, as believers, we cannot be deceived into following the modern virtue of tolerance to find a way to give any credence or respect or validity whatsoever to this pagan religion, nor to somehow equate the God of Islam with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I cannot know for sure, but unless there is a significant change on earth, when the four horsemen of the apocalypse finally begin to ravage humanity, one of their primary weapons may well be Islamic terrorism, and the Muslim hope to rule the planet. Even so, death is not our eternal nemesis. Because when the Lord finally defeats Satan, which in its largest sense is what the book of Revelation is about, he also defeats death. In fact, God eventually gets rid of death and the grave entirely. We read this in Revelation 20 as the, as the redemptive work of God nears its completion. It's one of the greatest statements of hope in the entire Word of God for those who trust in Yeshua, and one of the greatest warnings for those who reject Him. Revelation 20, 11 through 15, Next I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing in front of the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in those books according to what they had done. The sea gave up the dead in it, 
And death and Sheol gave up the dead in them, and they were judged, each according to what he had done. Then death and Sheol were hurried into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was hurled into that lake of fire. The final half of verse 8 says, speaking about the four horsemen, they were given authority to kill one quarter of the world by war, famine, and plagues, and with the wild animals of the earth. The they is the four horsemen. So the four horsemen were sent out together, as I said earlier, to work as a team. They each served a role to punish the earth's inhabitants. Satan thought this indicated he was winning. God was going to use it to bring about a nearly unimaginable level of redemption and restoration. And we'll continue in chapter, next, chapter 6 next time. For more teachings of real Bible study and to rediscover God's Word with Tom Bradford, visit Torah Class today on the web, streaming TV, or download the Torah Class mobile app.